we build sets there for some of the the world's leading theatre producers. Send a set out to the Metropolitan Opera recently in New York. Building a, a Miss Saigon at the moment. Build Mary Poppins for Camera Macintosh. One of the things I love most about running a theatre is the way in which theatre can make you see the world differently and think about the world that we live in. And sometimes the very best people to help us to see the world differently and to reflect on the world that we're in are artists with extraordinary creative ideas. So when I got the job, I said very clearly to the board that I would ask the artists and makers of the region what kind of creative leadership they wanted in the future and that I would do my very best to ensure we acted on those recommendations. Today, my guest is James Mackenzie Blackman, CEO and executive producer at Theatre Royal Plymouth which celebrated its 40th anniversary recently. I'm Mark Reeves from PKF Francis Clark and I'll be your host. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast to get updates and notifications on when our latest episodes are available. Hi James, how are you today? Hi there, I'm great thanks, I'm really good. Um, understand congratulations are in order. Just before we recorded this you announced Dame Darcy Bustle as your new chair. That seems very exciting. Yeah, thank you, Mark. It is really exciting for us and for TRP, but but mostly, you know, it's it's funny, isn't it? Lots of people have been congratulating me. I'm I, I'm actually just mostly thrilled for the organisation and for the city, um, and uh, we're very fortunate uh, that Darcy has um, recently established a base in in Plymouth, and um, when we were thinking about the new chair of trustees that we needed uh, to really deliver the TRP for the future. Uh, she was, of course, for all the reasons you'll understand, um, a fantastic candidate for us all to consider. Well, she certainly does immediately give you that ambassadorial and promotes perhaps Plymouth Arts scene on a, a wider stage. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Darcy is one of the greatest uh, artists of her generation, internationally renowned uh, ballet dancer. And uh, of course, you know, all the general public know Darcy uh, because of her time as a judge on Strictly. So, uh, and she is also, you know, beyond all of those things, fiercely bright and a lot of fun and uh, is going to be an amazing uh, ambassador for TRP in the years ahead. Uh, my favourite memory of her is on the Vicar of Dibley. Um, and if people don't get that reference, go and look up the episode because it's hilarious. OK, let's step back. Let's take a look at the theatre. I know quite a lot of people might be familiar with Theatre Royal Plymouth, might have seen a show or two. But I know that TRP is much more than the theatre. Can you give us an idea of the, the range of the activities that TRP undertakes? Yes, of course. I mean, we have our amazing building on Royal Parade in the city centre, uh, but we also have an, uh, an equally amazing building uh, at Catdown called TR2, which is uh, celebrating its 20th birthday this year, turning 21 next year. And that building is a hive of, of activity. It's a theatre factory, really. We build sets and uh, sets there for some of the, the world's leading theatre producers, uh, send a set out to the Metropolitan Opera recently in New York, uh, building a, a Miss Saigon at the moment, build Mary Poppins for Cameron Macintosh. And um, alongside that amazing production workshop that we have there, we also have three stunning studio spaces uh, on the edge of the water where we uh, rehearse and make our own productions, but where we also deliver a lot of activity for the community. Everything from youth theatre, youth dance, to projects that engage more vulnerable people in the city and from across the south across south devon and cornwall uh, and we are working in that building and in our building here on royal parade with with people all the time from our community to use the performing arts and to use culture to build confidence self-esteem uh, and their life chances i'll come back to that because there's a there is that client that customer engagement that engagement with the public that's really important but i just want to get some background what's your day-to-day -day role what's my day-to-day -day role um well it depends what version of me you're asking about um <laughs> between 6 20 in the morning and uh, 8 15 i'm very much daddy and then between sort of six o'clock and bedtime i'm very much daddy again um but inside of that time when i'm not in that other version of my life, um, I run this incredible organization and it's a great privilege to be chief executive 
of the Theatre Royal um, and to be carrying on and building on the amazing legacy that my predecessor, Adrian Vinkin, uh, left behind. Um, from a business perspective, uh, Adrian left a strong balance sheet. We've got a fantastic programme of work on our stages, the lyric, the drum and the lab. Uh, but my the additional part of my job as executive producer is to take the kind of creative and strategic producing lead on TRP's projects and productions. And over the over the years ahead, that is something that we really want to build at TRP. So something I work on an awful lot at the moment is managing and building our relationships with producers and artists to make more work that is of and for the people of Plymouth, made in Plymouth, and then exported, hopefully, uh, around the country and into London. That's fascinating, the connections around the world. Um, the drum and lab you mentioned there, people might be familiar sort of with the drum if they've passed it by, but what, what's the drum and the lab aimed at? Well, um, starting sort of in the basement, the lab, we're very fortunate to be to have three stages of three different scales. And in, in the lab, which is our um, small theatre in the basement, that, that is very much an experimental space. So a space where artists from across the city and across the southwest can come to develop ideas, develop their talent, uh, maybe put work in front of an audience for the very first time. Um, the drum is our space on the ground floor, 165 seat theatre, where we program more established uh, established companies and artists, where we're um, presenting kind of small to kind of upper mid scale work, perhaps more um, work that uh, appeals to a smaller a subset of people than work that, that that has the appeal of the 1300 seat lyric but always um, incredibly diverse um, often very surprising often very moving very touching intimate experiences where you're much much closer to the to the action on the stage um, and then of course there's the lyric which is our 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 main house auditorium uh, where we're presenting musicals and large plays and dance predominantly <laughs> I want to come back to the range of activities at some stage, but I do remember from the drum I saw oh, a long time ago, a ver uh, version of uh, Bugsy Malone, um, and it was really intimate. You were almost sat on the stage amongst the performers and then performing a range with you. Does that aid in certain productions, even though they might be smaller? It's a different sort of atmosphere. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely right. I mean, um, it, you know, if, if, if you're too close, you're probably going to get some sweat dripped on you, you know, or, um, but you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's an amazingly intimate space. And, um, you know, that definitely suits certain types of theatre making. Very much on that. Come back to you, because you've got an interesting journey yourself in here, in that you started in Plymouth. <laughs> Can you describe your rather circuitous route to come back to Plymouth? The yeah, I'll try. You've been involved in. Yeah, I'll 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 try. Um, so yeah, I'm a I'm a I'm a Jana born and bred. Very proud to be of the city. Um, was born in Freedom Fields when Freedom Fields was a hospital, um, and went to Knoll Primary School in Whitley. Uh, my parents then moved out to the Ivybridge area, so I went to secondary school in Ivybridge. Um, but I uh, was encouraged to join the youth theatre here at the Theatre Royal in my teens. And it was it was really here at TRP where I found my tribe, really, and where I discovered a passion for for the performing arts. And I knew by the end of my teenage years that I wanted to spend my adult life kind of creating off opportunities like like the opportunities that had been made for me, really. So I, I was able to articulate to a careers officer. Uh, at Ivebridge Community College in sort of the mid 90s that what I wanted to be what I wanted to do when I uh, was an adult as a career was to run a run an education department in a building based theatre you know that was a sentence that I said you know which to a careers advisor um, probably took took that person by surprise some somewhat and, and probably needed to be deconstructed a little but I was very clear that that's what I wanted to do um, I had two two gap years um one working at, at Plessy Semiconductors in Robra um, to raise money to um, to go off to Nepal to teach. So working, uh, my job at, at Plessy was to look for, for kind of bent legs on microchips. And I did that 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. on night shift for four days and then four days off and then uh, on on day. So we're taking days and nights um, and then, yeah, two years off, one year traveling around the world. 
uh, but eventually ended up in going to university in Liverpool, um, an absolutely amazing city that I adore. I uh, had the best time in the world being a student in Liverpool, read English and cultural history, but um, was very involved in the theatre scene there. Uh, and then moved to London and started a career in the performing arts, um, first in Greenwich, then in West London at the Lyric Hammersmith. Um, uh, and then after six very, very happy years at the Lyric, um, spent a couple of years at the National Youth Theatre of Great Britain as executive director, which was over the time that MIT were really involved in the, Olymp- in the Olympics in 2012, which was very special. Um, and then I went to spend a further six years running Matthew Bourne's dance company, New Adventures. And Matthew is probably the one of the most well-known dance makers in the world, most famous for his, his Swan Lake with male swans. Um, and I just had the happiest, happiest time um, at New Adventures and really grew all the charitable activities of that company and, um, yeah, got... The, had the great privilege of going all over the world and um, feel very, very fortunate uh, for that experience. But over the over the top of that time, um, I adopted my sons and running a touring company with young children is quite tricky. Um, and equally over my time running a big touring company, what, what I realized running a touring company is that you sort of belong to everyone and no one really when you belong, when you're a touring company. Um, and I realized that what I was passionate about was communities and people and place and civic pride and and all of that stuff. So I wanted to get back to running a venue. Um, and I ended up in Scotland for five years running Eden Court, which is Scotland's largest single site arts venue. Um, very kind of different organization in many ways to TRP, very similar in, in others, uh, had had COVID, uh, managed the organization through the pandemic. Uh, and then, um, as I always knew would happen at some point, Adrian Vinken was always going to retire, you know, or, 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 or move on. Um, and a little bit of me always wondered whether or not at the point that that happened, whether I'd be at a point in my own career where I would be ready for that job. Um, and, uh, and here we are. <laughs> I think there were odds on um, Adrian never retiring, which were quite good odds at that particular <laughs> moment. He'd been such a fixture because he took the theatre from over the, the, the journey of its forty years down here, and he's yeah. I mean, he he he, he a huge figure in the cultural life of the city and the region. Um, led this organisation for thirty two years, so an amazing tenure, um, and um, yeah, you know, luckily, I mean, I don't know, you know. It's, I'm sure lots of chief execs, when they take over from other chief execs, um, uh, don't have anything to do with their predecessors at all. But I'm very fond of Adrian. We, in fact, completely fortuitously, I uh, I bought a house on the Hoe, uh, literally around the corner from Adrian. So, um, so yes, we're uh, we're we're both neighbours, and um, I'm very fond of him. Good. I, there's always potential for conflict there in terms of doing things different ways. But Adrian has really tried to step back, I think, hasn't he? He's been incredibly respectful of uh, me coming into post. and um, But I do, I do take his soundings occasionally. I think that's the best relationship. I didn't know the, about the Plessy thing. My firm, um, my team actually did the transaction that kept them here when the Germans were looking to sell them in 2010. Oh right, yeah, yeah no, I, that's then, yeah, that's great. Yeah, no, it's an amazing building that they have up there, and um, yes, yeah, one of those very high tech industries that keeps Plymouth skill base alive at that stage. Totally. I want to talk more about that artistic, that creative side. Um, the local arts university has a phrase: "The world needs creatives now more than ever." That really resonates with me. Where we get so much stuff about science and that type of stuff. There's an old phrase that the scientist will enable you to live longer. The artist or creative will make you want to live longer. How do you go about that? How do how do we push Plymouth forward on that side? Well, it's a great question and um, something that I have been sort of very preoccupied with since I arrived at TRP. So we're, we're at the moment in a quite a significant recruitment drive to bring some artists onto staff. And um, because for many years, TRP has been has had an artistic director alongside a chief executive. And as we've mentioned already, the, the programme of work at TRP is 
immeasurably diverse you know everything from a kind of huge musical like Les Mis that comes and sits down in our city for four or five weeks to kind of two idiosyncratic contemporary dancers rolling around on the floor you know and every and everything in between you know um, and I love both those types of work equally I should I should add but I do think that the days under which one artist can take and hold all the curatorial power for a program that wide and range are behind us. So when I got the job, I said very clearly to the board that um, I would uh, ask the artists and makers of the region what kind of creative leadership they wanted at TRP in the future, and that I would do my very best to ensure we acted on those recommendations. And actually, through a, through an extensive consultation led independently of us last year, um, the, over, the overwhelming response from artists was that we should have a kind of a group of people that that take responsibility for producing and programming and, and having the curatorial power at TRP. So we've created sort of eight artistic pillars um, to our work at TRP, and we're just in the process of, of um, bringing leadership team members in to manage a theatre programme, a dance programme, children on people's program and then collectively that those group of people will work t- together to, to to program what we do i think it's a really important balance to be struck in terms of pushing that creative because it can often be seen as a, a not having a career path as not being able to actually do anything with it if you want to develop a career in it and we are somewhat away from london so will some of your work help that I hope so. And, you know, we've been really clear in our recruitment packs that what we're not expecting to um, to find are people that are ready to be artistic directors of building based theatres. You know, we're, we're, we're absolutely looking for people that want to um, be supported in a journey to getting to that. You know, a success measure will be if in five years time um, our associate director for dance comes and says, oh, you know, James, I'm off to be artistic director at the place or London Contemporary or Sadler's Wells you know with that 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 will be a success measure for us um, because it is very difficult to build a career as an independent artist and um, we want more artists on our payroll because as you say the world needs creatives now more than ever. I suppose that's one of the things I do see uh, on the university side in the the arts um, university Plymouth gets judged on career paths and it's one of those of, well, you can take a scientist and they can step through. You can take a mathematician, et cetera, et cetera, an accountant, they can step through. How do we encourage that arts career? This is one of the really key questions going forward, especially with a country that produced Shakespeare and stuff. Mm. It's one of those soft power ones that I, know, I get annoyed about. But I want to, on your recruitment side of things, you, you're uh, advertising for a Artist for Change climate emergency a lot of other podcasts we do and we touched on net zero and climate change what's the focus of that role well the focus of that role is that clearly as a society as a society there needs to be significant significant change and the clues in the title around our attitudes and our relationship to the climate emergency that we are in and um i one of the things I love most about running a theatre and being in a theatre is the way in which theatre can make you see the world differently and think about the world that we live in and um, sometimes the very best people to help us to see the world differently and to reflect on the world that we're in are artists with extraordinary creative ideas so what I want to do um, and we're very fortunate to have been supported by Jerwood um, Charitable Trust to to create this role is to embed an artist in our organization who is passionate about the climate emergency and supporting people, communities, people uh, and organisations to um, present work that is kind of climate focused, to um, put some of those big questions in front of audiences um, and to work with our team here to ensure that we're doing more at TRP to uh, reduce our emissions and and think differently um, and be that voice in our organisation who is responsible for making our uh, bringing people together to um, to to help us understand and explore the climate emergency better. That's re- I hadn't thought about it in those sort of terms. Again, that science versus creativity side, in that you've got lots of scientists, ninety nine point nine percent of scientists yelling about climate change, and lots of people ignoring them. 
the creative role, the artist role, is then in that communications, that persuasion, that demonstration side of things. Again, a nice contrast that you need both. You can't just do with one. Yeah, I can, I can, I completely believe that, and I think, um, I think a little bit about like soft power and soft advocacy, you know, and and, um, and that there is there will be a, a role and a function in 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 that post here at TRP, which, which, which will hold responsibility for that for sure. Yeah, soft power. That's the thing we keep on overlooking on a regular basis. I think it's something important. Um, My firm's got uh, offices in various locations, but you'll see Plymouth and Exeter struggle with each other and compete with each other occasionally. And I think that's what Exeter's done really well for the last sort of 20 years is develop that sort of soft power. But I get a sense that Plymouth over the last sort of five or 10 has started to actually feel its own voice, has started to develop that. Yeah, I think that's I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I, I'm still fairly new to the city, but I think Plymouth um, has so much to offer. Uh, and um, you know, I, I talk a little bit occasionally about wanting Plymouth to to be more Liverpool. And what I, what I mean about that is that I see a lot of similarities, sort of geographically. But my experience of living in Liverpool was that um, if you're a Scouser, if you're if you're of the city, you are immensely pl- proud of being a Scouser. And um, as someone who is a Plymouthian, grew up here, went away for 20 years and has come back, I'm desperate for more local people to be more proud of their city. Um, and um, and if I can in any way contribute to that change, I will be honoured. I, I go back to the MTV Crashes Plymouth about eight, uh, six or seven years ago, possibly eight. Um, and it was a beautifully beautiful day and the cameras kept on not just shooting the stage, but shooting the area. Mm. And you were looking around going, actually, yeah, I do live here. Actually, this is yeah. quite a nice place to actually live in. Yeah. Um, do we do overlook that on a regular basis down here? Um, come back to the business of the theatre. There's obviously a dynamic, and you mentioned it sort of earlier, between staging a big musical where you can book it in and it's six weeks and the, the, uh, the bums are filling the seats all the way through. How do you balance that with the smaller productions that deserve the airtime, deserve the promotion, but will attract a lot smaller audience? Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question. And I'm, I'm afraid to say there isn't a science that we follow or an, or an algorithm. It's all about balance um, and diversity of programme. I mean, often audiences will probably think and listeners will probably think that on those really big shows, we're, we're making mega bucks. It's not always necessarily the case, you know. Um, you know, you do, you, all you need is a calculator to work out that, you know, if we've, if we've filled the Lyric Freight shows and it's 40 quid a ticket, you know, we're probably grossing at around sort of 250, 300K over the course of a week. The reality is that, you know, um, 80% of that is going back out the door to the producer. Um, we're only holding on to 20%. So our levers around income are limited. But so, you know, we have got to make up our our, our income and our profits on the bars and on catering and, and on retail and on retail. So um it is a very, very careful balance. Um for 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 many years the drama has been a, a has been a loss making an endeavor. You know, um everything that happens in the drum, you know, when that 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 venue isn't running in the running in the black, um it's it's running in the red, but the but the lyric is helping to subsidize that alongside also paying for our our payroll and, and our bills. But, you know, it's it's also very important to say that we are, you know, in a post-pandemic world with energy prices doing what they're doing in a in a in an increasingly precarious um position. Um and um we have to evolve the business model over the years ahead um to provide some stability to TRP, which is really critical. Uh, I'll take on that energy side of things and come slight angle. You opened this role as a warmth bank over the winter. What drove that? Um, well, it, it it was driven by the fact that TRP needs to be open over the winter um, because we've got shows on. And our very unique location here in Royal Parade, which is that, you know, buses from every part of the city and every part of the wider region stop literally on our doorstep. 
um, which is a which is a which is a fantastic thing. Um, and I just wanted to remind the people of the city that um, the doors were open and it would be warm inside because we needed to keep the theatres warm. And so, if people wanted a place to come uh, and uh, sit and have a coffee and read a book. Uh, rather than paying for their own bills at home, then they should they should come and do that. And and that's really about um, my interest and um, desire for TRP to be uh, demonstrating the impact that it, it it has and it can play, and using its assets in the best way possible to to meet the needs of the people of our city. Well, I kind of liked it on two ways. There's obviously the compassion, the, the being part of the society, but I also liked it on the promotion side. It was quite a nice reminder of people, of the building, et cetera, et cetera, whilst also doing the right thing. Um, on that sort of thing, you're introducing, is it, is it relaxed performances for some presentations? What are the, what do those entail? Yeah, I mean, we've been doing relaxed performances for, for quite some time. There are just more of them now. Um, and um, mo- mostly the way to describe a relaxed performance is that it is that. Um, the lights will probably be up a bit. All the doors out into the foyers will remain open. Any kind of very loud bangs or crashes or pyrotechnics that might be in a show are cut. And it enables um, uh, vulnerable people, neuro- neurodiverse people, who might um, be triggered or might struggle with the kind of specific nature of the normal theatre going experience to come and enjoy TRP. So it's a really important part of our programme. And and actually, you know, one of my most precious um, memories of my first year at TRP was our one of our relaxed performances for pantomime. And there was such high demand that we, we removed the sort of first four or five rows of the stalls to be able to accommodate all the wheelchair positions. Um, and um, we, it was just a completely joyous atmosphere that afternoon to see sort of over a thousand people that might not ordinarily uh, feel that TRP was for them in a, f- in a fully relaxed and fully um, accessible space. And um, it was, yeah, it was a great privilege to, to bear witness to that. I think it's more, you mentioned about TRP, that's more about public inclusivity though, isn't it? It's not just about going to this, it's actually being able to go to a theatre and being part of society again, rather than sitting to one side. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's really, really right. You know, we want TRP to be an inclusive place. I absolutely understand that probably our biggest barrier to access is cost. And um, I think about that all the time. And um, we're really committed at TRP to finding ways to um, to make TRP accessible. I think that's always going to be a balance for all of the theatres at that stage. Um, and it's not going to get any um, easier going forward. Um, you mentioned the pandemic earlier. We, we don't focus too much on the pandemic on this podcast. What we try and do is pick out the positives. What you, you mentioned about running the theatre, was that the theatre in Inverness? During yes. the pandemic. Yes. What positives did you see out of that? What were the the obviously set against a very bad background, but what positives did you see come through that? Well, we took a very unique approach at, at, at Eden Court in Inverness in that we we were in real trouble very quickly for in, in the way that lots of performing arts organizations were because our income stopped and we had to start refunding all of our tickets. So not only was there no money coming in, there was a lot of money going out. Um, and I, um, I spoke with the chief executive of the local authority and I said, look, you know, we really need your help to sustain and stabilize the business um, and protect us from insolvency. And in return, we will support your humanitarian aid efforts uh, at, at local authority level. So we worked very closely with the council over the pandemic. We never closed the theater um, and all of our kind of food parcels um, that were going out to vulnerable people were being um, sorted, packed and delivered from from the, the main stage at, at Eden Court. We did a massive audit of our, our, our staff skills um, to see how our, our staff could be deployed within in the community and you know little things like you know if someone had asked me pre-pandemic how many languages do you think are spoken amongst your workforce I probably would have said oh some Polish some Latvian and some Gaelic um, uh, and probably would have said you know we've got three languages in our workforce in fact we had 11 languages in our workforce when we actually surveyed them and asked 
Um, we had a couple of young lads who were absolute expert chess players, you know, and so we just learned an awful lot about the talent within our workforce. Um, so, so all of those things felt like positives and things that I am immensely proud of. Um, uh, yeah, it was a very difficult time. And I think for chief executives of performing arts organizations, we're sort of, st I, I'm not sure we've ever kind of quite dealt with the trauma of that period yet. You know, we <laughs> we were so, you know, I, I don't know a single uh, chief executive of a performing arts organization that furloughed themselves. Um, but looking back, my goodness, I do regret not doing that for <laughs> for a couple of months. Um, and actually this post-pandemic period of recovery has in many ways felt um as challenging so um yeah we're 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 getting we're getting there um but there's probably uh probably a need for some sort of therapeutic reflection in a nice country <laughs> hotel at some point in the future <laughs> where you all get together at that stage and just reminisce i, yeah. I think that you're definitely not alone in still being traumatized by that there's lots of bosses of organizations um just a couple of others um alternative views what's your view on the messenger statue out the front because i know it provoked opinion at the time and i should declare that i'm quite a fan of it which will lose me a few listeners at that stage but what's your viewpoint on it uh so my view on messenger my, well my view on messenger it's actually not specific to messenger actually um I, I i actually don't know what my opinion is of messenger because it's i don't know if i've ever sort of pondered it long enough really which might surprise listeners but what but what i do feel is that 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 ambitious cities need public art and um, cities like Plymouth need things like Messenger to um, provoke conversation and debate. That is what art is, right? And I really enjoy a wry smile uh, overhearing uh, members of the general public walking past it and absolutely hating on it and members of the general public discovering it for the first time and uh, pausing for a selfie it is doing exactly what it should do and so um with that in mind i think it's a huge success <laughs> very neutral answer that perhaps i should try and remember that one for the future just so i don't get into too much trouble um you mentioned about tr2 what's what's some of the unusual things that tr2 have actually had to manufacture for stage shows you mentioned about ballet you mentioned about miss saigon what's the unusual stuff that they've had to cope with over the years well i think probably the most unusual um or the most unexpected that listeners might um might not be aware of is that can you remember a time when there was that huge public art installation of poppies at the tower of london tens of Very thousands so, of yes. tens of thousands of 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 clay poppies all of those were made and manufactured at tr2 um so yeah that's that's always an interesting one Excellent answer. I, ha I have one of those. Uh, my mother-in-law has one of those, which we bought because we were up there and we tracked them down back to here. And it was just such a, a moving art installation, if you like, up there of just seeing it, know knowing what the poppies represented, etc. That was a really true thought provoking um, art side of things. Can I just one more difficult question for you? putting your cards on the table, and we'll see how you work the diplomat's answer on this. What's your favourite theatre production from a production, from an executive producer's viewpoint? What would be your favourite production? I, I did warn you it was an awkward one at that stage. Yes, um, I, I really struggle with these questions, I'm afraid, because um, when you are, when, you're, when you see as much theatre as I see, it, they they do at some points all start to sort of blur blur into each other a little bit um and i've got and i've got i've got many sort of many favorite seminal works um uh there was uh, an extraordinary production of um the caucasian chalk circle with um juliet stevenson uh that actually was presented by trp but um but at the pavilions and that was in the 90s i remember seeing that really viv i remember going to see that show very vividly and it was one of the most extraordinary and different things i had ever seen i think it was probably about 94 95 um so that production still lingers 
um, in my in my thoughts. I remember like the opening night of Wicked in the West End when that show came from Broadway for the very first time, and just the sort of huge visceral treat that 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 Wicked is. Um, I uh, m- more recently um, took my son to see Mary Poppins for the first time, and um, there's something very very special and precious about being uh, with him, seeing that. Um, but the memories that I really treasure are, you know, uh, my own experience of going to the pantomime as a child and now also being a parent. And um, I, my, I, we're just at a sweet spot now. My boys are nine and, and six. So all the kind of fart bum and willy jokes that go into <laughs> pantomime are just absolutely hitting the spot. Um, so, um, so yeah, it's, so yeah, that, that's, that's those a good are all answer. Home. Yeah. I, I suppose I pick out that first um, visit thing. If there ever was something where you could wipe out your first memory so you could experience theatre for the first time again, that would be such a thing. Because those are strong memories. Ideal. Thank you, James, so much for joining us today and for sharing your story with our listeners. I hope I've learned something new about the theatre and the business side of the arts world and perhaps can live up to that creative um, concept we're talking about. And thank you to our audience for listening to our latest episode of Business Noodles and Doodles. Hope you've enjoyed the conversation. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast to get updates and notifications about when our latest episodes are available.